But when I get to be in these characters' skin and following them along a journey, and I get to dictate a lot of how that's delivered to the audience, you know, I'm largely in control of that. It's um, it's more, it's a more demanding voice acting job than any of my other ones, but it's also more fulfilling. This is the Listening Books Podcast. I'm Jessica Stone, and today's conversation is with the multi-talented Stephanie Cannon, an American voice actor, circus performer, and audiobook narrator living in England. We talk about what that's like, how walking on stilts complements reading in a box, which kinds of books she loves to narrate, and conversely, which ones she'll take a pass on. We also discuss Kate Dillon's cyberpunk dystopian novel Mindwalker and its sequel Mindbreaker, both narrated by Stephanie. Stephanie, thank you so much for joining me today. I wonder, can you start us off by just telling us how your career in audiobook narration took off? Well, I I was doing various bits of voice acting, but really only a few little things. And I decided to really go for it and have a bunch of CDs made out for every single genre you can imagine. And I um, I was really proud of them, and they looked all flashy. And I sent them off to everybody in the book of contacts, which is like the industry go-to or was back in the day when everything was more printed, and sent it to every single, you know, radio station and TV production company, all these things. And I sent it to all the audiobook production companies as well. And I got other little jobs along the way, but it wasn't until three years later, after I'd sent one of these CDs to Audio Go, which um, are no longer in business, but they were based out in Bath, and they were the ones who used to be BBC Audiobooks. So they, I got an email out of the blue asking me if I was available and if I wanted to do this book with them. And I said, well, yeah, I mean, yes, please sign me up. <laughs> Three years later, though. So I used that as a story to tell everybody it's, it's not an instant overnight kind of a, a career, but, you know, if you persevere and you've got some patience... <laughs> Not everybody has to wait for three years, but I mean, it tells you that people do hang on to your demos. So. Yeah, I mean, I'm sort of in my head. What, like, what do you imagine happened uh, that they came across your demo again at just that point? At just the right time, yeah. I mean, that's the kind of timing that you just really can't control. It's so out of your hands. I think that they were probably just trying to get some new voices. Maybe some people got a bit probably out of their budget, and they needed to find oh, some right. new people who were less <laughs> famous and less, um, less, you know, uh, moving on. Some people just move away geographically as well. So, yeah, I think they just needed some more people in their books. And luckily for me, I was still there and looking to do some books with them. And that was a really lucky start for me because my first book with them turned into doing quite a few books a month. And I became one of their go to young American voices. And they were really great, lovely company to work for. And while I was narrating for them, I started to talk to more people. And they say, Oh, have you met Alex at so and so? And so yeah, they were my beginnings. But then I was also narrating at the RNIB and at ID Audio, and a bunch of other companies based in and around London. Yeah. So yeah. So you, um, like me, are American, right? Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering, um, being an American that's based in England, mm -hmm. how does that um, affect the kind of work that that you're able to get? Mm. Well, definitely it's different from the publisher's point of view in that obviously they produce a lot more English books with English characters as the protagonists than they do American books. So when I first start out with an audiobook production company, they don't necessarily have a lot of titles that are suitable for my casting straight away. Um, but what does work in, to my advantage is that when they do have an American book that comes in that needs a female, that has a female protagonist, they always think of me because there's a much smaller pool of us Americans here. Right. Um, and I think when they think of me, um, they know that I can do a range of accents, so a lot of different American dialects, as well as some of the British ones as well. 
Mm. So if they have a book that's set in a sort of sci-fi realm or is set all over the world in lots of different countries, they'll think of me for the American stuff, but they know that I can cover a wide range of accents as well. Yeah. Do, do you find um do you find yourself having to guard your American accent from influence by the accents that you're surrounded by? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes more successfully than others, definitely. <laughs> I always have to. I get in, you know, I've lived in England for 18 years. And as you can hear, my accent's completely changed. I've got a transatlantic accent now, which I do use sometimes for sci-fis and for um, historical fiction. It can be really great for that kind of thing. But when most of the time I need to go back to my roots and I need to find my either my original accent or a version thereof. So I'm from Alaska and I spent a lot of time living in California as well. So I'll go back and just like with any character, you just practice and you read the words aloud until the voice really sinks into your body and sinks into your, your mouth and your head and all that. Um, so it does, I have to like smack myself on the wrist if I round my O's too much and if I pronounce my T's, you know, like water. <laughs> right. <laughs> because, yeah, I've, I've definitely, I speak different than I did when I first got here, that's for sure. Um, I understand you have a varied uh, performance career, not just in audiobooks and not even just in voice acting. In fact, did did I read correctly that you're also a circus performer? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's another one of my weird, fun jobs. Yeah, I've been doing it kind of accidentally. I didn't mean to become a circus performer, but uh, it must have been, I don't even know, like 12 years ago, I auditioned for this all-women circus company called Circa Rumbaba. And they were hosting these auditions, and they wanted to bring new stilt walker performers onto their roster, into their company. And I remember the audition announcement said, we're looking for people who are talented, versatile actresses who are good with improv, great with accents, and you need to have the willing to walk on stilts, but you don't need to have the skill. We'll teach you. And I was like, hang on a second. There's an acting job where you don't need the skill required? <laughs> that sounds way too good to be true. And so I went along to this audition and it was a workshop style. It was really playful. We were just like these characters. We were bouncing off of each other and running around the room like crazy people. I was a bug one second and a pirate the next. And it was still to this day, it was the most fun audition I've ever done. And I'm still working with that company today. And yeah, one week I'm an 18th century lady on stilts and I'm nine feet tall and having all sorts of fun with the audience. And then the next week, yeah, I might be a pirate or an alien or you name it. <laughs> so I can hear some of the crossover, like some of the elements that um, would be similar, the, the different characters that yeah. um, that you can be and that that, perf that performance aspect. But I imagine that it's also, um, it must be really fun to get out of the studio and, and do something that is completely involves different. so much more of your body. Exactly, exactly. There's a little bit of physical work that goes into you know, voice acting, especially if it's a, a video game and you're up on your feet and you're doing lots of combat or other things. But yeah, it's nice to get out of the booth and to be on my feet and doing something that's really physical. And it's also nice to have the interaction. That's like yeah. the really big difference is having people that you're bouncing off of straight away. You're getting laughs, you know, you're, yeah. you're doing a lot of interacting and improvising. Yeah. So it's and, nice to do something that's not script based. Yes. And to let like somebody else, like to let somebody else's performance influence your own performance. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. I can see that be being really fulfilling. Yeah. And having all of those, you know, different jobs together. So the audiobooks and then, you know, video game and animation and acting is quite different from long form narration. And then the stilt walking is even more different. So having those you know, kind of, I, th I think of those as like three different types of jobs. It makes me feel way more well-rounded. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't want to just be stuck in the booth doing corporate narration or whatever. Yeah. I mean, what's, what do you think audiobooks require of you that maybe other kinds of voice acting don't? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, audiobooks, a lot of people will say is like the 
the marathon of the voice acting world or the narrating world because, you know, it's a it can be a long slog, definitely. You've got a couple of days of prep to put into a book and then a couple of days of recording, depending on how long the book is. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a big time commitment and you're definitely spending a lot of time in a dark box that doesn't have very much air. <laughs> so there's that kind of endurance side of it. But I've just, I've, I always, I took to it really quickly and I just, there's something about being able to be swept away to another world for that length of time that I feel is really special as well. Mm. You know, sometimes if you do a commercial and it's just three sentences, boom, you know, you're in, you're out. It's a very different kind of feeling. But when I get to be in these characters' skin and following them along a journey, and I get to dictate a lot of how that's delivered to the audience, you know, I'm largely in control of that. It's um, it's more, it's a more demanding voice acting job than any of my other ones, but it's also more fulfilling, mm. I think. Mm. There's a lot more work that goes into it. You know, you've got to look, you've got to find pronunciations for things, and often you've got to dive into accents that maybe are new to you or maybe you're not super, super comfortable with, so you just, or you need a refresh. Maybe the last time you did that accent was three years ago. So, yeah, there's definitely a lot more that goes into it, but I feel really great by the end of it. You know, you've produced this whole, this um, this big thing, you know? Yeah, that's a lovely way of talking about it. Since since you mentioned some of the 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 work that goes into it, I wonder if you might uh, want to tell us a little bit more about what that process looks like for you once you've been cast for an audiobook. Yeah, well, once I've been chosen, then I have to be very organized about how I plot everything in my calendar. I've got lots of different color codings to make sure that I don't pack too much in and to make sure that that I haven't overlapped schedules too much. I like to have a little bit of time in between books just to for vocal rest and to get my head out of that world and to be able to prepare to go into a new world. So, yeah, just making sure everything's really tidy in my calendar so that I don't go crazy and so that I don't double book myself and say and then end up having to do, record two audiobooks in one week. And then in terms of prepping the book itself, I love using I Annotate on my iPad. And I just have an iPad mini, which means I can take it in my handbag. I can take it anywhere with me. So the nice thing about prepping is I like to go, if the weather's nice enough, I'll go outside somewhere, find a nice um, bench or somewhere in the downs near me. And I can do my prepping on the go or in a nice, lovely nature spot. And then, yeah, with I Annotate, it's really great. I can um, mark my characters as I go along. I just make little bookmarks for each new character that arrives on the scene. Oh, that's that's smart. Yeah, it's really and it's handy because it, I do need to go back to it for referencing quite often, either um, later on in the book. So let's say. A character is introduced in chapter one, but then it's not until chapter four that they're described as having a husky uh, voice with a Russian accent. Mm -hmm. And so you go, oh, okay, that's definitely worth noting. So then I go back to my bookmark and I put in those notes. And then it might happen that I'll go back to that bookmark, you know, three or four times as you learn a little bit more about that character. So I either um, make notes about the the vocal qualities, the accent, maybe you get a hint about where they're from, or an extra little detail. They're from this place, but, it, you know, they've got an American dad and an English mum. So that might affect how their voice is, what kind of school they went to, all these things that give you hints. Sometimes the author isn't really direct about how they sound, but you get social clues and you go, okay, well, they went to a posh boarding school, so they're definitely going to be quite articulate and confident in their speech. And then if I'm doing a series or if I'm doing um, a dual book with another narrator, then it's really helpful to make recording, so little sound clips. And I just do those embedded directly into my PDF and make little clips for how that character sounds. And then I can use that for my own reference and I can also send it on to the other narrator so that they've got an idea of, oh, okay, this is how she's making her character Robin sound or whatever. Um, yeah, and then that's really helpful for me because I often do books that are part of a trilogy or a series. And then I'll open up the previous PDF 
from book one when I'm doing book two, and I can listen back to those clips and see how I describe that character so that it's probably not going to be fresh in my memory anymore a year later. <sighs> but I've got those notes to look back on. That that sounds so organized and uh, and so just so smart the way that uh, the, the way that you approach it. It's come from many, many years, uh, sometimes doing it the wrong way and then kicking myself in the butt. Like, <laughs> oh, God, I have no <laughs> idea what she sounded like. Why didn't I make a sound clip? But most of the time, the production companies, if you haven't saved it yourself, they'll happily send you um, send you clips or they'll send you the entire audio, <laughs> yeah. which is a lot to go through, though, if you don't know exactly where that character first speaks. <laughs> yes, absolutely. That made me think about um, how much work goes in before you start recording and how the compensation model for audiobooks is, generally speaking, um, that you're paid per finished hour, um, mm-hmm. not per production hour, so not per hour that you spend working on the material, but per finished hour. So if it's a 12-hour audiobook, then your rate is is times 12. Yeah. And so the the question is really, is there anything about that model or about the industry as it stands that you would like to see changed? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a tricky one because, I mean, the UK publishing industry, it's not like rolling in cash. I I definitely, I mean, who wouldn't want to be paid more, right? I think that most audiobook narrators and editors and engineers and all of that, they, yeah, they're all deserving of a pay increase. And the for finished hour rate, it's the way everybody does it. And I suppose I can't see it diverting from any other any other method because if they did it differently, then basically, if you were actually being paid for your time, then people who are making more mistakes and haven't prepared well enough are essentially mm. going to get paid more just because right. they're taking longer. So I get the the sense behind why they do it that way. Um, it encourages people to to come into the booth prepared and to try to make everyone's jobs a little bit easier by by being as focused and on it as you can. Everybody makes mistakes. But I think that, you know, there's got to be a bit more flexibility and allowance for books that are just more complicated. And I think in the U.S., they're, they're a bit better than the U.K. market for paying people for books that just are going to entail a lot of research so if you have to look up, you know, a hundred plus words of pronunciation, sometimes they'll help you and they'll give you a guide, but not always. So that's extra time that goes into your prep mm-hmm. that could be several days of of going on um, Youglish or Forvo or any of those sites to make sure, or even contacting some friends and you're like, oh, there's a load of Danish in this book, so I need some extra help. So it's not just the time that it takes to listen to the pronunciations, but to source them and then to practice them, to go over them quite a few times so that it's not just a correct pronunciation, but it actually sounds effortless and it sounds mm-hmm. like that's your native language is how it needs to sound most of the time in books. So I do think that there should be compensation for when there's going to be a lot of extra prep for a book for sure. Um some companies try to do that, but not all are able because it's just not the practice and they haven't budgeted for it. So, yeah, that's that's a change that I would definitely like to see. And for the extra effort of when you're doing um, multi and dual narration, there's extra emailing and collaboration and admin that has to go on behind the scenes before you even start recording. So actually, when I'm doing so the book that I'm going to start recording this week I've got another male narrator who's doing the main love interest. Mm -hmm. And you have to read the whole book. You have to know what's going on and know what's going on with the characters. But I'm only going to get paid for the time that I record, which is less than half of the book's total length. So there's a little bit of injustice there because a lot more prep has gone into what I'm going to get paid for, really. Yeah. So yeah, there's some there's some ways in which it could be improved. And because I mean, think about all the jobs that are out there. And if people got paid for the product rather than for the time that they put into the product, mm. it's a little bit. I think it does need some reevaluating. Yeah, it just is on my mind, I suppose, because of the 
actors, the the Hollywood strikes, um, just brought to mind uh, questions about what's fair and what's compensation. And anyway, I hadn't I hadn't planned on asking you any of that, but it's just as you were talking about it, I thought, hmm, I wonder. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely yeah on topic, and it's it's narrators, but I feel like. The narrators are the only ones put into the spotlight of like, we're underpaid, we're, you know, we're doing a lot of work. Mm. But I mean, all of the editors and proofers and people that I know, it's just like everybody could Mm -hmm. use a little bit of an extra (laughs) bonus for the for the hard work and the time that they're putting into it, you know? Yeah. 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 Especially considering that all the reports are how booming the audiobook industry is. Exactly. It's a really important conversation for anybody involved in the arts because it's this it's this historical thing that for some reason has been completely accepted that artists just are okay with working for free or working for less. Mm. And so if you've got a project and they're looking to cut the budget in any place, everybody always goes straight to the artist, whether it's, you know, fine arts or it's, um, you know, the, the TV performer or whatever. They always think, oh, okay, well, if we can cut a little bit, you know, they'll work for free. They're used to being an actor. They were a waiter before, so they're they're grateful for the work, right? <laughs> and it's this attitude that's just kind of, yeah, it's it's just existed for such a long time. And you think, well, are, are you working at a discount rate on this project? Mm. I didn't think so. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a really good conversation to be happen- to be having all over the world, not just, you know, in Hollywood. <laughs> I hope you're enjoying this conversation with Stephanie Cannon. There's more to come, but first, let me remind you that voting for this year's Members' Choice Award is now open. Listening Books members have until the 30th of November to cast your vote for the best audiobook of 2023. Visit the extra section of our website, that's www.listening-books.org.uk, or use the direct link in the show notes. Stephen Fry will announce the winner in January. I just wondered, when it comes to choosing books that you would like to narrate, what makes you go, yeah, that book is for me, I'd like doing that book, and I'd be able to do it justice? Hmm. Well, obvious answer is just anything with good writing. (laughs) As Mm. soon as you read the first couple of pages and you're like, oh man, I'm there. I'm hooked. This has a lot of heart. It's obviously going on a really interesting journey. I mean, my favorite books to narrate are ones that have a strong female protagonist, um, which is becoming way more popular these days. So I've got a lot of great books that come my way where you're just like, all right, she's She's a, she's a bit kick-ass, she's sassy, she's like, and she's, you know, like, strong female characters that aren't just involved in a romance. And, yeah, there's um, some books that I've done recently that have, like, a strong LGBTQ story behind them as well. So I'm really interested in in books that have, that have a little bit of that to say that is kind of giving a minority voice a, a, a pulpit for a change. Um, a book that I narrated recently called The Sharp Edge of Silence by Cameron Kelly Rosenblum. It's from the point of view of three different high school kids. They're all at a a private boarding school. And the whole premise of the book is um, touching on misogynistic culture and that sort of thing that that happens in boarding schools. And so there is um, some triggering rape um, that's happened to one of the characters. But the way that it's handled with the writing is really delicate. It feels very, very real. But there's, because it's told from the point of view of three different characters, you get a lot of different perspectives that, even though the subject matter is heavy, it feels like you're there in a real, everyday kind of way. And I just, I love doing books like that where, you know, 10 years ago, that kind of YA wouldn't have existed. I definitely wasn't able to read books like that when I was, you know, 15, 16. So I just love the fact that these are out there now. And um, I couldn't read them when I was younger, but now I'm able to bring them out to, you know, young people. Yeah. I mean, conversely, is there anything that might make a book (laughs) off-putting? 
Yeah. I mean, that's a really good question. So what was, I'm trying to think, honestly, what was the first thing that came to mind when you asked that? Because there's a couple of different things. I suppose if it looks like it's got a lot of uh, a different language that I'm not familiar with, and I know I'm going to have to look up and and ask um, around and and perhaps go on social media and find somebody who, you know, is fluent in German or whatever, whatever the accent is, um, if I haven't got a lot of time in my schedule, a lot of extra time for doing that kind of research and extra prep, then I might go, oh, my God, this is not the week for me. <laughs> Put that book on to somebely who speaks German fluently. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it just depends. Sometimes I'm up for the challenge if I've got the time. And if the writing is really good and you just can't say no, then, you know, you'll, you'll take it on just because it's really worth it. Um, so maybe, yeah. Uh, foreign languages that I know I'm not competent with at all, I might I might veer away from them. Or, I mean, just anything that's, that looks like it might be putting women in a negative light mm -hmm. or just doing some stereotypical thing that I think, nah, we're better than that. I want I want someone who's who's telling a really good tale and is going to serve as, I don't want to say role model, but, you know, Something that I'm going to feel proud of at the end of it. Because there is a lot of crap out there as well. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, if I'm going to invest my time and my name is going to be behind this thing, I want it to be something that I can say that my nieces should listen to or that my family or, you know, my peers and just say, oh, you're going to love this. This is really great. It's got a good message or whatever. Mm. Um, yeah, so if I can be proud of it, regardless of what genre it is, then... That's that's the stuff I'm going to say yes to. I love that answer. Maybe now's a good time to talk about one of the books you've narrated that we have in the Listening Books Collection. Ah, yeah. Um, that's Mindwalker by Kate Dillon, mm -hmm. which is dystopian, sci-fi, cyberpunk, yeah. um, action-packed, all the things. All the best combinations. Um, and I understand you've just recorded the second book in the series, Mind Breaker. Can you say a little about that experience? Yeah, so I loved recording Mindwalker, I think that was last year, um, because of all the things that I said about having a strong female character. Syl, um, in the last book, she was just like brilliantly snarky. She's got that edge to her that's really relatable. Um, you know, she's interesting enough that it's always it always remains accessible, I hope, but she's you know, she's tough, but she's also really intelligent. And she's got an interesting journey that she goes on throughout the book. And it's just a really fun combo. I love sci-fi, but it's got a lot of action to it as well. But it's I think that's a really good skill for a writer to be able to pack in as much action as like a Marvel film would have without losing any of the heart. Because there's quite a lot of emotion that happens um, to do with her past and the characters that she encounters along the way. So it's, you know, it's, it's a really good, rare combination of things in that book. And then just two weeks ago, I recorded the sequel, which is Mindbreaker. And yeah, different lead character. Um, so, but like a really similar world. Um, so you've got that still the fun sci-fi and action-packed element, but like I said, a lot of heart still. She's not as snarky as Syl was. She's got a little bit more reserve. She's really smart, um, but again, she goes on this journey that's you're just you're just with her every step of the way. It's really interesting and quite tough in some moments because it deals with separation from family and a lot of really difficult life decisions um, on the brink of death and having the whole weight of the world on your shoulders. Yeah, I recommend it. Listen to both of them. They're really great. And Kate Dillon was really accessible as an author to talk with in my process, because with, with fantasy and, and sci-fi books, you often have a lot of made-up names that don't really exist in the world, real world. So I can't just look them up and find out what the correct pronunciation is. And most of the time, an author is really flexible. But you know that if they're writing it, They've got something in their head where they think that, well, even though I've made it up, this is how it's pronounced, you know. <laughs> and so with Kate, she sent me a lovely pronunciation guide. Um, so a list of, of names of, you know, different made up countries and planets and, you know, corporations and, you know, the, the names of the characters. And then with an audio clip as well of her saying how they're each pronounced. 
So that's really helpful and really nice when you've got an author that's passionate about what they're doing and is really easy to collaborate with. Yeah. What was the casting like for that? Did they come to you? Um, did you see it and audition for it? Um, I would have been put forward through my agent, um, spoken for. And they, yeah, she loved it, loved my my reading. And it was just one of those instant ones where it really clicks. And I felt like it clicked when I was doing the audition. And you just go, ah, oh, I, I, like, I can breathe this character. I can really feel like what she's going through and I find those characters just really fun to to voice where they've got they've got an edge but they're inside there's a lot of softness as well Mm. um yeah so I just thought she was fun when you get when you get an audition like that and you're like yes I love her (laughs) then it's always obviously really nice to hear that you've been chosen um but yeah it really clicked with that one and I she wasn't sure whether she was going to use a different voice for the next book because it's a different character. But but we get on so well, and she had me be put forward for that one just to see how it sounded, and it tested well. And, you know, a slightly different voice from the last one, and definitely a different character. So, yeah, so I'm really happy that I got to do both. Oh, that's great. Let's, uh, let's move on to your personal reading. Um, do, you, do you like to read outside of your professional work? <laughs> That's a very good question. I mean, before I started narrating audiobooks full time, I was an avid reader. (laughs) But now, because I spend so much time sight reading and just, you know, my eyes and my brain do get quite tired. So the last thing I want to do at the end of the day is pick up a book (laughs) because I'm just I've got book after book going. So it's a little bit sad in that I don't I, I occasionally I've got a paperback with me on a holiday and that's joyous and I get to open it up and read the old fashioned way. But because my brain is so used to annotating, it's really hard to shut that off. So I'll, I'll open the book and I'll start to, you know, put little notes in <laughs> in the margins. And I say, Steph, you can just read this book. You don't have to write down which character is speaking, what their accent is, just, you know, clock off. But it's quite hard <laughs> to do that. So and because I have headphones on for a lot of the day as well, Sometimes I just like to do something that's completely different from audio and from literature in my free time. But when I do, um, when I've had enough of a break for that and my eyes and my ears and all that are rested, then I do love to listen to audiobooks and audio dramas, audio um, drama like podcasts, generally something that's really different from what I would record just mm. to be in a really different world or or listening to um like a multicast with lots of different voices. Yeah. Just so it's very different from what I've been narrating that week. And that makes sense to me um, that you would want to give your attention to something that you're not already tired of <laughs> or tired by. Um, that makes a lot of sense to me. I wonder, do you have, from what you've been listening to or from what you've been um, reading either professionally or personally, do you have any recommendations for listeners? Hmm. Yeah, so I I recently went to um, APAC in New York, which is the, oh no, I'm going to get it wrong, is it the Audio Producers Alliance? Something like that. Um, so it's like the big, this huge company that's all, all things audiobook. Um, so it has lots of um, audiobook narrators and publishers and producers and all of that involved. Um, and they do a lot of really great um, webinars and events and things. Anyway, so I went to a couple of, to this big conference that they have and met a lot of these amazing narrators who are also really big coaches. And now I'm obsessed with some of the books that they recommended um, and that I've been listening to. So Johnny Heller is a really great American um, narrator. And I mean, I think you can't go wrong with anything that he narrates. He's just got a really, really great, super characterful voice. And he's a brilliant actor. Um, and I'm the one I'm listening to at the moment is called Noir. Mm. And yeah, it's it's fantastic. And then another fun one that I've been listening to, which is really different from anything that I've listened to before. I didn't realize that books could be like this. It's called Heidi's Guide to Four Letter Words. And it's narrated by Andy Arndt. And she also co-wrote it. And it's it's just really tongue-in-cheek. It's, it's kind of a rom-com with a bit of, 
you know, a bit of, what do they call, like white lace, you know, a little bit of sexy scenes in there. But it's it's done in a really mock, um, very like aware of the industry kind of way. Mm -hmm. Um, So... It's it's it has to do with her being involved in. She's very um, sort of a prudish character in the beginning, but then she accidentally gets involved with working for a, a porn company, and so <laughs> she's um, editing and having to record these really raunchy things that are just you know too X-rated for her virgin ears kind of thing. And it's just <laughs> it's hilarious because it's you know has to do with audio production and has to do with people um, producing uh, audio porn, pornography, and stuff like that. Uh, erotica and yeah and so because she she really knows the industry and she's got all these brilliant characters throughout it's it's a really fun ride so it's I I usually so associate rom-coms with being um a bit sappy Mm -hmm. but this has a perfect level of humor in it and I really love it and she's a brilliant narrator what was the name of it again it's called Heidi's Guide to Four Letter Words I love that and it's narrated by Andy Arndt and then for something really different, I really like to listen to docudrama style things, whether it's um, an audiobook or a, a, a podcast. So uh, The Space Race by B7 Media, it's all to do with, yeah, all things space, basically, from back in the Buzz Aldrin days to more modern, like Tim Peake stuff. It's a mix of actual um, interviews that they have from various people involved with NASA and whatnot. Um, And then some of it is taken from transcripts and then reenacted and done in a kind of drama, um, audio drama style way. So it's it's nicely mixed and it's a really, it's very interesting and it's really well produced as well. Like the sound and the acting and everything is great. Those are wonderful recommendations. Thank you. One last, one last question. And and that is just if if listeners want to find more of your work, find out more about you, where should they go? Yeah, my website is sparkthecanon.com. That's S-P-A-R-K-T-H-E-C-A-N-N-O-N.com. And yeah, they can listen to, I've got all kinds of clips on there, and it can refer you to other work that I do as well, besides audiobooks. and. Yeah, that's it. That's me, Spark the Cannon. Stephanie, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much for your time and your thoughtfulness. Thanks very much for having me on. It's been a pleasure. Really nice to meet you. Thanks so much for listening. I've put a link to Stephanie's website in the show notes, and you can find her on social media as well with the handle Spark the Cannon. If you enjoyed this conversation, I'm sure she'd love to hear from you. And so would we. Find at Listening Books in the usual places. We also always appreciate a written review on your favorite podcast player. I'll be back next week to wrap up this series with narrator Emily Wu Zeller, whose voice you may have heard reading best-selling books like R.F. Kuang's Poppy War series or Helen Huang's The Bride Test. Don't miss it. It's a great conversation. This podcast is produced by Listening Books, a UK charity that provides an audiobook lending service for over 120,000 members who find that an illness, disability, learning difficulty, or mental health condition affects their ability to read the printed word or hold a book. It's simple to join. For more information, head to our website, www.listening-books.org.uk. 